In today's Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, we're going to be talking about which SD cards you need to record 400 megabit all intro on your GH5 running version 2 of the firmware. Now, if all you want to know is which cards to buy, I'm going to tell you that right after the opening segment. But if you want to know more information about why that's the card to choose, why other cards may not work as well as expected, and also if you want to learn what all those funny little numbers mean on the cards, we're going to go into all of that throughout the show. But if all you want to know is which cards to buy, I'm going to tell you that in just a moment. And of course, if you do decide to buy a card based off this show, please do scroll down and grab one of our affiliate links down below. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first almost daily live show every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, no longer every weekday morning here on YouTube at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, talking about all things photo, video, live streaming. If it's got a camera, it's fair game. That's the way we look at it here. So today we're talking about which memory cards you need to run to record 400 megabit all intra on your GH5 running version 2 firmware. And as I promised in the opening, we're gonna go straight into which cards, and then we're gonna get into the reasons why. So here we go. Recommendation number one, it comes off of a brand called Angelbird. Now you may have not heard of this before. I actually had not heard of these before myself. Angelbird cards are the only cards that through all my research and talking to all my sources, we've come up with being an absolute 100% compatible. These cards work. Now, Panasonic has their own cards, the Panasonic branded cards, but as most of you know, they're really expensive. They honestly were not made for mass consumption. They were really made as a proof of concept. Panasonic had to, have, they had to make sure that cards were available at the time of shipping of the camera, and so they made them without ever any intention of mass producing them. Angelbird is the brand to get if you want total compatibility. There's two different cards. You've got the Angelbird 64 gigabyte. This is a V90 class card, and this is priced at $95. This is on B&H, and of course these prices may change depending on when you're watching this. They also have a 128 gigabyte version, V90, priced at $200, so basically doubling the price there. Now that is choice number one. Second choice, and I'm gonna tell you why this is a second choice. Second choice is to go to the Delkin cards. Now Delkin has both V60 and V90, and we will be going into the differences later on here. The V60 though is a 60 megabyte per second. 90 means 90 megabyte per second. It's important to remember that 400 megabit is 50 megabytes. So 60 megabytes is enough, it's more than 50, you should be good. You gotta add a little bit for audio, not much, and you want a little bit of overhead. So 60 technically should work, and even Panasonic says you want V60 or above, so you should be fine with the V60s. So let me run through these things, and I'm gonna tell you why these are second choice. We've got 64 V60s from Delkin at $55, so we're talking almost half the price. You've got 128 gigs, V60s at 95, 96, and you've got the 256 gig V60s at $200. So again, half the price or double the capacity for the money. Delkin also makes V90 cards, so these are basically the same price as the um, the Angel Wings that we're looking at. Angel, did I say that right? Angel, Angel Bird, not Angel Wings, sorry. And these guys are coming in at, let's go to the V90 again, uh, basically the same price, so $90 for a 65 gig V90 from Delkin and $220 for a V90 128 gig. There is no 256 gig in the V90 from either of these manufacturers. There's one card that I found of a brand that I'd never heard of before, so I don't have any information on how good they are, so we're gonna bring up that brand at the very end of the show. Now, why, oh, oh, one other thing about Delkin, Delkin is apparently, I can't get 100% confirmation on this, but Delkin and ProMaster are a, probably the same company, maybe same card, same manufacturing process, they appear to be the same. ProMaster I cannot find in the United States other than, in, well at least at the big stores, B&H and Amazon. I found old, like really slow cards for point and shoot cameras on Amazon from ProMaster. Maybe ProMaster is available in your region, so they should basically be the equivalent of the Delkins. So why are these cards, especially at V60 being half the price, not the number one choice? Because even though they record fine, when you stop recording, when you're shooting, uh, when you're shooting 4K 60p, when you stop recording, it can take up to five seconds for the file to close. Now, file closing means that everything is done writing to the card, the wrapper is completed, you have everything on the card, and you're ready to play back or to continue shooting. It can take up to five seconds on these cards. However, on the Angel Bird cards, again, make sure I got the right Angel Bird, on the Angel Bird cards it closes within a second, which is what it's supposed to do. So on the Angel Birds, the files close within a second, as they're supposed to, it should never take longer than that. 
on the Delkin and ProMaster cards. They're taking up to five seconds to close. Why is this? It points to a possible problem with the controller, and this is the important part of it. This is why these are not first choice cards. The controller may have issues. That five second closure is not supposed to happen. It'll still work. Your file will close fine, but you may have issues with it. So there's your recommendation. Angel Birds are first choice. The Delkin or ProMasters are your second choice, and you can save money going to the B60s on those. So that is that. So now, deep breath. Let's get into all the reasonings behind this. We're gonna start by going through a card and looking at all the individual little numbers and talk about what each one of these means, talk about a bit of the history behind it because a lot of this stuff that shows up on the cards, it's like mad science. And why are there 16 different designations on this stupid card? Just tell me if it's fast enough. So we're gonna talk about all this. Incidentally, if you have questions, do post the questions in the comments here. If you're watching live, if you're not watching live, post them in the comments down below. If you're watching live, make sure you put at photo Joseph in front of it. That means it shows up, where my mouse go? That means it shows up on my screen, nice and bright and red and shiny like that. That allows me to see those comments. If you have comments, if you have questions about a specific card, save that to the end because I'm probably going to answer your question throughout the course of this video. If uh, you have general questions about the cards and so on, then by all means, pop those in there. If you have questions that aren't related, please save those for another show. We're going to stick to the topic at hand here. All right, let me get my slides set up here and let's do this. Wrong one, there we go, this, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so here is a memory card. We're using the Angel Bird ones here just because it's nice and clean. We're gonna talk about what all these numbers mean. So first one up, this one, the 10, with a little partial circle around it. This is actually a C, go figure. It's a C, it means class 10. Class 10 is an old, old designation. You're gonna find this class 10 designation on basically everything. Class 10, all that means is that it can support a throughput of 10 megabytes per second. And remember, for this 400 megabit, that's 50 megabytes per second. This is a 10 megabyte, so it's obviously, 10 is nothing but you're gonna find that on pretty much every card you buy today. Why it's even still on the cards is really just a legacy thing in case someone buys a camera and it says must have C10 or better. If they find the C10 on the card that they're looking at in their local Walmart, then they know that that's gonna work and that's really the only reason it's still on there. One of the things that I can't answer is why in the world the SD conglomerate, whatever they're called, keeps changing the format. So. This C10 class 10, there were class fours and maybe twos before that. Class 10 was a maximum. Now, why they decided that they couldn't go up to C20, C50, C90 is beyond me. But for some reason, when they got to C10, they decided, that's it. We've run out of Cs. We have to go to something else. And that's when they switched over to U, the U format. So U3 means 30 megabit. So it's no longer 30, it's now a three, and there's a U in there, so that's obviously supposed to tell you that that's 30 megabit. So most cards, again, that you buy today, most good cards, most higher-end cards are going to be U3. U3, 300 megabit, great. Okay, so that, and this is write speed, by the way. So 300 megabit, still not enough for what we're doing today, but it is certainly enough for most shooting. You can actually do 4K, 30P, um, standard, you know, actually, you can, no, I take that back. You can even do 4K 60p at the 150 megabit on there, no problem, because it 100, 150, no, 100 megabit, 100 megabit, is that what it is? Anyway, your standard GH5, GH4, higher end setting. I only have U3 cards, that's all I've got right now. I haven't even bought any of these higher end cards, and they work fine for even 4K 60 on my GH5. So, not 400 megabit, obviously. So, that's what the U3 means. Next, we have V90. So again, the U class, they decided we can't go higher than U3. Why? Why not go to U9? I don't know, they've decided to change it again. Part of this is the U3, they kind of said, okay, U3 is really for photographers. It's not about sustained rate, it's about more maximum. And remember, your, your camera's got a big old buffer and it holds off lots of photos and offloads them off to the card as you shoot, so, you know, that should be fine. But at some point, the card manufacturer went, well, you know, we need another designation specifically for video. That's what the V90, oops, wrong way. That's what the V90 is, V is for video. <laughs> did you know that? I did. Um, v is for video, so V90 is 90 megabit, V60 is 60 megabit, so, Mega megabytes, sorry, megabytes. So uh, V90, 60 megabytes per second, V60, 60 megabytes per second. Remember, our 400 megabit is 50 megabytes. 
I know, it's insane. Uh, so we're well within, again, at 60. We're just under it, but we're well within range with 90. We got plenty. 90, you can shoot up to 8K. Go figure, 8K video. At least that's what it was, was spec'd out for. So that's what the V means, V for video. So if you're buying cards specifically for video, looking for that V class is a good idea. And we'll talk more about why the Vs aren't on all cards in a little bit here. Next up, oh, this. Okay, if you find a card that has an X like this, 1000X from Lexar, that is a really old way of describing things. I think Lexar is the only ones, and of course they're no longer making cards, so it's kind of irrelevant, but you will still find these in stores. The reason that the X is there, it's actually relation to CD-ROM. Remember those things? Shiny little discs, you now use them as coasters. Actually, God, CD-ROM, this is back to like your AOL day. You got AOL CDs in the mail, remember that? That's how old this is. This is 1,000 times the speed of a CD-ROM. Like, what does this actually mean to anybody? It's ridiculous. So um, I think the 1,000 X is here. I had to send a note here. Um, according to, by the math, it's 120 megabit, but, uh, megabyte, sorry. But I had this written somewhere else. Um, there is another number that Lexar says. Lexar says their 1,000 X cards should be up to 150 megabytes per second read. 80 megabytes per second write. So in theory, that'd be V80-ish, but that's not a spec, it'd be, so it'd be V60. Um, but you'll see that there is no V60 on here because they have not been classified for that. So anyway, that's what the thousand X means if you see that. All right, back to these cards. So SDXC or SDHC, important differentiation there. I wanna make sure I get this all right. So SDHC is an older format and it's a smaller maximum capacity. The maximum capacity of an SDHC card is 32 gigabytes. Yep, got that right, 32 gigs, that's your max. Okay, so you cannot have an SDHC card that is more than 32 gigabytes. Doesn't exist, can't exist. When you get over 32 gigs, it automatically switches over to XD8, SDXC. That's your, I think, extreme capacity or something like that. Now, I was trying to figure out what the maximum capacity was. Um, it seems, <clears throat> it, it, there's like, different specs around, I'm not quite sure why, but I found reference to um, it being a maximum of two terabytes. So in theory, we could have SD XC cards up to two terabytes. Can you imagine two terabyte, <clears throat> excuse me, on an SD card? Oh boy. But in theory, you get that big. Um, but there's a fundamental difference between the two of them other than size, and it's the file format. So SDHC is FAT32, SDXC is XFAT. The big difference there is the maximum file size. Not the maximum card size, but the maximum file size. On FAT32, the maximum file size is four gigabytes, which is why if you owned a GH4 or you have a GH5 and you're using these older cards and you shot a long segment, every clip, every long piece, anything more than, it was about six minutes, I think. Well, of course, it depends on what file, for, what aspect ratio, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, frame rate you're shooting at, but your file sizes on the card would be broken at four bit, uh, four gigs. So you'd hit four gig and it would create a new file, create a new file, create a new file. It's fine, you drop them on the timeline, they all sync up perfectly, but uh, but it did create a new file. The XDXC cards, which are XFAT, don't do that. They're, now this is where I really got, couldn't find the right consistent information. <clears throat> I found references that SDXC cards formatted as XFAT could be as big, a single file could be as big as 96 gigabytes. I found references to 512 terabytes for a single file. And then I found a reference to 16 exabytes for a single file. Now that seems a little excessive, but point is you, what you're shooting on your camera, on your GH5 should not break into multiple files when you're shooting with an SDXC card. Okay, so that's what that is. Whew. Next is the two that you see on here. That is UHS speed. That's a UHS-2, which has a minimum of 30, 30 megabit, I believe it is, 30 megabytes per second. U3 is stated 30 megabytes per second. This was, this came out for, specifically for 4K shooting, 4K video shooting. Now, you've got the U3, which is basically saying the same speed, but this is a designator that's more for video. Remember I said the U3 is more about still photography? The UHS-2 is more about video, video users. So there you go. <clears throat> okay, so there's that one. See, told you too many stupid things on here. This number, when you see a number megabytes per second, you go, wow, look at that, an actual number that I can read like a normal human being. 
that is read speed, not write speed. So 300 megabytes per second reading speed, and this is a maximum, not a guaranteed throughput, not a minimum, not a consistent, this is a max, a peak speed. So while your card may pull at 300 megabytes per second, it'll probably only do it for a few seconds, and then it's gonna back down to a little bit slower speed. That's the way that is. <sighs> That's all the important stuff. Next, the size, 128 gigabyte. That is, of course, the size. And just in case anyone isn't sure, this little tiny lock, there we go. <laughs> My video is slightly delayed. Anyway, this little lock thing here is a write lock to your card, so you can't actually overwrite the footage on there. You will also find sometimes that as you're sliding your card into your camera, that lock button accidentally gets slid, and you put it in, and it says your card is write locked. And you're going, what? What do you mean? And you pull it out and you go, oh, stupid lock. Anyway, if that's what it's for. Um, I, I guess it's handy. You know, if you, if you take your card out of your camera, you're done shooting, hitting the lock is a good way to tell yourself this card has images on it. Don't put it back in the card. Um, don't accidentally format it, yada, yada. But anyway, that's what that's for. Okay. I think that was everything there. So that is that info. So let me go back to my other notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And make sure I didn't miss anything there. There's a couple of articles that I'm going to link to down below that reference a lot of what I just talked about. There's an older B&H article that's really descriptive, has a lot of this information. There's a Wikipedia article on SD cards that's, that's quite informative. So I'll, if you want more about these things, I'm going to put links below to all of that. <clears throat> okay, now let's get into other cards, cards that should work. The specs say they should work, but they might not work. And this is, this is pretty important. Okay. We're going to start with Lexar. Lexar, as you know, is no longer in the card making business, so it probably is irrelevant except that you can still buy cards from them uh, because there's still stock in stores. And you have to realize, you have to remember that um, that they might, or they, well, not remember, you, you have to consider that you may find them for cheap because if companies have them, B&H, Amazon has them, if they got a big warehouse full of them, at some point they're going to want to get rid of them, so they're probably going to let them go for pretty cheap. So you got to be careful if you're going to buy these and what you're buying them for. Uh, let me see here. I can actually, before I go into this, let me scroll through the comments here and see if there's anything that I want to address that is germane to what we've already talked about before I move on. Uh, let's see here. Um, even Evan Weaver, do all the new recording modes on Firmware 2 work well with Mac and Premiere Pro? Uh, I actually don't know if Premiere can handle the 400 megabit files. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It, I would hope so but I don't know. Trevor, what's going on is not Panasonic's fault. It is that the card manufacturers are clearly either not doing stringent QA or cards are being labeled at a higher rate than they actually support. This is exactly what we're about to get into, and you're right, this is not Panasonic's fault. Uh, Evan says 6K H.265 <coughs> photo mode now works with Mac as well. Sorry. <coughs> still that early, cold, early morning cold air run yesterday that I had to do was not, still hurts me. Anyway, uh, I have not upgraded my Max to High Sierra yet. It is supposed to. H.265 should be supported in High Sierra. I have not upgraded yet. I'm waiting for the Final Cut update because that's a critical part of my workflow that I know is going to have things to go along with it. For all I know, Final Cut may have updated it and I just haven't paid attention to it yet. But that's what I'm waiting for. But I really need to do it. I'm probably going to do it on my laptop first because I need to start talking about the new photos. But um, anyway, I, I haven't yet. So I can't confirm it, but it should. Um, yeah, Christopher's saying, remember, 8 bits per byte, right? You know, if you want to do the math, on, on what um, these are. Here, let, me, let me pull up another window here. Um, this is really kind of cool. You can, let me just go to Google. You can do this. You can say 400 megabit in megabytes per second. And it'll bring up this calculator. Digital storage, megabit, megabytes. So there's a nice, easy way to find that just in case you were curious. Okay. Um, Evan Weaver says, is the new anamorphic 400 megabit version usable without an anamorphic lens? Well, what happens, the anamorphic, when you set the camera to shoot anamorphic, it is shooting in a 4-3 aspect ratio with a de-squeezing built into it. So it's expecting you to put an anamorphic lens on there. You don't have to put a lens on there. You can shoot that way, but you're going to have a funny looking, funny looking content. So there's no point in shooting that way. You get 400 megabit in the, um, in the non-anamorphic modes as well. And Martin says, so glad you did this meal in this video as it's a minefield. Yes, it absolutely is. That's why it's taking so long. Uh, Paper Hustle says, do you think Panasonic will come out with an SSD USB external recorder? SSD USB? Um, no. No, that's not their business. They don't have anything like that. I can't imagine them coming out with that. Um, and if you're thinking about a 
recorder that you would plug into the USB port on your GH5, that wouldn't work anyway because that's not where that's not the way the data flows. It doesn't flow that way. Out the HDMI, of which of course we already have dozens of these on the market, um, but it doesn't flow. The full data path does not flow through the USB-C port in real time. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. So let's talk about cards that should work but may not. Actually, before we do that, sorry, I'm just going to do. I'm going to take this opportunity to remind you about my GH5 training. If you're watching this and you're going, this is really cool, but I want to know more about my GH5, which is why I'm watching this in the first place, because I have one, then you got to go to gh5training.com. This is a complete video training course for the Lumix GH5 that I produced. It's all about, it's all about me. No, this is all my training. It is five and a half hours long, all about the GH5. I will, incidentally, I will be adding more videos specifically about the version 2 update, so that's things about 400 megabit all intra, about, um, about uh, what do you call it, tethering, um, on all the other good stuff that's included in the GH5 version 2. I will be creating new videos for that. Those will be added on for free to current owners of the training, so buy the training now. There you go. Uh, GH5training.com. There you go. Okay, and let's let's move up from there. Okay, so now we're going to move on to my other details that I want to go through. Okay, Lexar. Why Lexar might not work? I'm just going to read a little bit of what I wrote here. It's just make sure I get through my notes right. So the UHS-2 at 1000X, which we saw a little screenshot of that, should work, right? Because it's 150 megabit um, read, it's 80 megabit write, megabyte write, it should totally work. But there were multiple revisions of the card and Lexar never changed the packaging. So you don't know when you buy a card which one you're getting, whether you're getting Rev A, or Rev B, or Rev C. So Rev A, it had, let's see here, it didn't have, let's see, my notes say the, it was UHS-1 to start if the camera didn't have the proper flagging. Now I don't exactly know what that means, that's a note that I took in the middle of some conversation, totally sure what that means, but you may only, depending on your camera, and I guess this probably isn't a problem with the GH5, but depending on your camera, you may actually only get UHS-1 speeds off of the card, even though your camera is UHS-2 capable. Mm, good to know. It has a low-quality controller, which we talked about before, means that it can take a long time to close the files, um, and in this case, it can actually result in not only camera slowdowns, but corrupted files. So those 1000X UHS-2 cards, if you've got a Rev A card, you don't want it and you don't really know what you got. It's just, it's bad news, so eh. Rev B got better. There were less issues, but it wasn't perfect. Rev C, they seem to be okay. Rev C cards seem to have fixed all of the issues. However, they are not classified as V60 or V90. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. SanDisk. SanDisk has a 300 megabyte per second card, the UHS-2, so right, all qualified, but it does not have the V60 or V90 recommendation. Now by our classification, now by the numbers, it should be perfectly fine. But without that V60 or V90, that means that either they didn't submit it for testing or it didn't didn't pass the testing. Most likely they didn't submit it. Why would they not submit it? Because they know it's not going to qualify. Why wouldn't it qualify? Well, it may be that they're using parts that aren't good enough. This is one of those things no one really knows. They're not gonna tell us why it's not V60 or V90. But the point is that they are not classifying it as that. They're not taking it for the testing. That can't be a good sign. So I would not recommend buying cards that do not have that V60 or V90 recommendation on them for that reason. Another reason that it may be is that NAND memory needs to be used for V60 V90s. They may not have NAND in them. We don't know. Okay, next, another brand, and someone mentioned this in the beginning, ADATA, A-D-A-T-A. -A -A. Let me bring up the link to this card. Let me show this to you. I had never heard of this card before last night. I was digging around and I came across this. It is a V90, okay, 128 gig. They actually go all the way up to 256 gigabytes V90 cards. Um, $300 for the 250. This is a great price. Like the 128s that we're looking at 200 elsewhere are, well, they're also 200. Okay, so that price isn't any different. Uh, 64s are 130. Okay, so those prices aren't different, but they go all the way up to 256. Sounds pretty good, right? It's got all the right numbers. It's got the V classification. So definitely worth checking out. I just don't have any data on them, so I can't tell you for sure that they are good or not. But the V90, they should totally, if they pass the classification, they should totally be good. I wonder, what does that look like to you? What does that card look like? It looks like a Lexar card, doesn't it? It looks like the old Lexars before they went to the whole gray motif. I'm, I tried, again, I did a little research, couldn't find anything. I wonder if they're just copying the look to make it look like Lexar, or since Lexar's getting out of the business, maybe Ada is picking it up? I don't know. I don't know. But 
it's worth looking at, especially if you want a 256 gig card. It's the only 256 gig V90s that I found, and for 300 bucks, that's a good price, right? That's a lot of data for the, for the uh, price, so a lot of storage for the price. So definitely worth picking out, but I cannot recommend them as I have not heard anything about them at all. That's it. That's everything. God, that was fun. That was a lot of stuff. Uh, Making sure I got everything. Oh, the last note that I have written down here is if you're having troubles with your card, it could be manufacturing variations like we had with Lexar, where they went through Rev A, Rev B, Rev C, and didn't tell anybody. So it's all you, there's all these classifications and things, but it's I guess there's still a lot of shoddy stuff out there. And as someone recommend, or said earlier in the comments, maybe people are, are mislabeling. Maybe companies are intentionally mislabeling. Maybe they're saying, we're just going to stick that on there. I don't know. I don't know how this stuff is monitored. I don't know how, uh, how much of a critical eye the SD organization has on this. But anyway, you've got my recommendations on which ones to buy. Uh, Patrick Good says, what about Lexar 2000X? I didn't know there was a 2000X. Same thing. Same thing. You just don't know. Let me see what I can find here. Um, Lexar, oops, Lexar 2000X. Um, 32 gig, okay, here we go. So again, they don't have the V classification on there. So there's a 2000X, class 10, UHS 2, uh, UHS speed class 3, th that's 300. Yeah. Doesn't say. Doesn't say V60 or V90, so again, without that V60 or V90, I wouldn't go there. And again, remember, Lexar, out of the picture. Now, I suppose, especially if you can get them for cheap, that was 32 gigs for 55 bucks. That's pretty cheap. That's the same price as the V60s. Um, it's worth buying and trying them, right? At the end of the day, if it works in your camera, if you don't have any problems with it, then great. Go for it. Lexar has been a great brand, right? Lexar has been a very good brand for very, very many years. So if you, it's not that I would say, you know, aftermarket card, you know, wouldn't rely on it, might die after a year. If the Lexar, when you get it, you format it in your GH5, you do a bunch of tests, it works perfectly fine. You don't get any drop frames, you don't get any closeout problems, you don't get any corrupt files. When you hit stop recording, you're ready to start recording again within a second. If those things happen, then by all means, use the cards. Go for it. Um, but, and if they don't, return it. Keep your receipt. Make sure you do your testing within 30 days. Uh, and if they, if it doesn't, then well, then there's the answer to your question. All right. Uh, let's see, anything else going on in the questions here? There was a question, there were some questions that were up earlier. Uh, make sure, let's go ahead and drop those in now. The, the folks who before the show started, I told to drop their questions in later. And Trevor says, the real curiosity for me is why SanDisk has nothing in the new V6 or V90 space. Well, it makes you wonder if producing consistently high performing media is actually more difficult than expected. Exactly, I mean, that's exactly it. They're just probably not putting as much into it. I don't know. Joshua says, DSLR shooters channel said the 128 gig A data card worked well for them. Oh, excellent, good to know. They released a video yesterday. Okay, good. Look for a D look for a video from DSLR shooters uh, about the 128 gig A data card. I don't know if it's A data or A data A D A whatever however it's pronounced, but the A data card. That's good to know. That's great. I'm ex I'm I'm. Oh. oh, everybody says we're down on the stream. Oh, but it looks good on this end. Hmm. Okay, anybody who's having issues, just re refresh your browser. That often fixes things. We're reporting no issues on our end. Um, okay, oh, Ryan says now it's buffering in the preview. Well, there we go. Back up, back up. Okay, good, everybody's back, sweet. All right, so let me go back to the comments that we're going by. So again, just in case you missed that, A data. Uh, DSLR shooters apparently released a video on the 120 gig A data card, said they worked for them. So awesome, thank you for that. Okay, uh, I know one of the questions that was up, so I will just I will just answer this that came up in the very beginning of the show was why would anybody shoot 400 megabit all intra in the first place? Okay, here's the first answer is quality. It's higher quality. Higher bit rate is higher quality. This is why we will often record. Well, often one of the options is to record to an external device like the uh, Ninja Inferno to record straight to ProRes, which is I think 800. Megabit? I think that's right. I think it's 800 megabit. So significantly higher than the internal 100 megabit that we used to have, and still twice as high as the 400 megabit internal that we have now. That's your bit rate. So more data per second means better quality, less compression, less artifacting, less chunking. As you're probably seeing right now in this YouTube video, the gray background behind me might have a little bit of pixeling in there. The subtle gradients don't handle up so well at low bit rates. 
um, that's the kind of thing that you see in the lower bit rate. So as you get higher bit rate, that goes away. Also, as things change, so one of the, this goes back like 120 years, but one of the um, early demos that you might recall, I used to work at Apple. I was at Apple when we introduced ProRes. And I remember doing a demo on stage at IBC in Amsterdam showing full uncompressed 444 video on a split screen playing next to ProRes. And the video that we used was a ticker tape view, like a you know a camp, long lens down a street alley with a ticker tape thing going on. So thousands and thousands and thousands of little pieces of colored paper flying all over the screen. This is a compression nightmare. This is where you will see macro blocking like crazy on any kind of compressed image. On the uncompressed, obviously you're not gonna see it because every frame is uncompressed. It's beautiful, full data capture. As you start to compress that, it falls apart pretty quickly. The ProRes was virtually indistinguishable from the uncompressed. That's how good ProRes is. Okay, so now let's go back down to 400 megabit. It's half the data rate, give or take, of ProRes. That's still pretty darn awesome, right? That is really, really good. So that is the bitrate part of it. Now the second part of it is the all I, all intra. What does that actually mean? So most video, when you're not in all I, when you're in something called long GOP, GOP is a group, it stands for group of frames. So it's a long group of frames. And what happens is you have an I frame, which is a full data frame. That is all data in the scene is written into this frame. And then you have a series of, of um, delta frames where every frame is not full data, it only, it only contains the differences between what would be in that frame and the frame before it. And so essentially the software editor has to do math. If you park on that frame, it has to do math to say, all right, hold on, uh, it's this frame, uh, do the math with the frame before it, the frame before it to get together what this frame should be. So for one, your quality is not as good because there's a calculation that has to happen to render that frame. And when you're editing, it's not as fast because if you don't park on an iframe and you don't know which are the iframes, if you don't park on an iframe, then you have a little bit of rendering time that has to happen before the frame is displayed. All iframes, all intra frames, mean, it means that every single frame is a full data frame. There's no delta frames in there. So that's the difference between the two. So ultimately the difference is quality. The 400 megabit all intra is a better quality image than the other one. Do you need it is obviously the big question. For most people, no, you don't. For most people, what you get off the GH5 today and pretty much every other camera out there is fine. If, however, you are working at a higher end production, you're gonna do, um, I don't know, more intense color grading, if you're gonna really be pushing the file a little bit farther, um, if you want the absolute utmost quality out of the signal, then you're gonna go to that 400 megabit all intro. That's what it's for. I mentioned this on the show a couple days ago. I was down at Sammy's camera in Los Angeles on the one on Fairfax, but two Fridays ago, whatever it was, and I was chatting with a Hollywood customer who had come in to buy a camera for a movie set, and he was buying a GH5 with the version two update and a bunch of other fun toys. And he said that in their research, it was either the GH5 with the version two update or an Ari Alexa. Pretty cool. Nothing else does this 400 megabit at this price point. Nowhere near this price point. It's kind of awesome. So if you need that quality, that's what it's there for. Okay, so what else is going on in the comments here, in the chit chat room, and then we're gonna close out the show. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, oh, where'd it go? Trevor says, um, I think what could, what could happen with Panasonic is the same thing Nikon does. Nikon has a list of approved cards they test. Panasonic may have to force manufacturers hand to make their list. I don't know if Panasonic's gonna do that. It's a, it's a funny thing, Nikon doesn't make memory cards. Panasonic does, even though they're not making mass quantity cards for this spec. So it's a gray area, right? They, I agree with you, they should. I would love to see a Panasonic list of approved cards, but because they do make cards, even though they know they're overpriced and not really available, I mean, if you go to the, look at the Panasonic card in B&H right now, it says out of stock. Uh, I don't know that they will. I wish that they would too. I think it'd be a good idea, but if not, that's what I'm here for to help communicate this message. <clears throat> Martin says, would it not make more sense to get external recorder when you consider the cost of V90 cards? Well, not necessarily. I mean, an external recorder, there's a lot of other things that go into that. First of all, well, there's the cost of the recorder and then the cost of the SD, SSD drives, right? You gotta get a bunch of these things, which aren't cheap. The amount of data that you're capturing goes up quite a bit, right? The files on these are a lot larger. You, therefore, you need a lot more storage space on the back end just to record your files. Every show that I do here, I record to one of these as my backup. It comes off, it's a, an hour long show is upwards of 100 gigs, 
right? That adds up quick. It's half a terabyte a week. So I don't store those. I archive them. I down res them to, um, to an MP4 file for archival purposes. But what is actually recorded is straight to ProRes. So those are huge files. That's a lot of data to move around. Plus, if you're shooting with your camera and you want to be able to get into, if you want to be discreet, you want to get into small places, having it to be able to record internally, of course, is paramount, right? Having if you have a, a monitor on top of it, you kind of need a cage. You don't really want to mount the monitor on the hot shoe. It's a bit much to put on the hot shoe. So you've got a cage and you've got a monitor and it's just, it's more gear, which you could get to a point where you've added so much gear, you're going, wait, what was the advantage of shooting with a small camera again? So one of those things to consider. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, WC Images, I have four of the Lexar 2000X working fine at 400 megabit with both slots populated. Excellent, thank you WC Images for sharing that information. So there you go, uh, first-hand information of success with those 2000X cards. Christopher Pepe says, if you ever shoot interviews at a desk with a window behind you, you need 422 and vlog to get the detail out of the window. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's because you're getting a really expanded dynamic range. The Unless you're gonna really light the heck out of your subject, which would be the other solution to that, put enough light on your subject that there is, is as much light on them as there is on the outdoors. It's just like shooting HDR photography. You have to expose for the sun. So you can't control the sun, so you expose for that and then add enough light to your subject to match. But if you can't do that, then shooting in vlog at 422 is the way to go. Thank you for sharing that, Christopher. Joshua says, more data per second with 400 megabits, but it isn't negated by the fact that every frame is a keyframe. Uh, not negated by it. Sure, it's great for lots of motion, but is it good for minimal motion videos? Um, is it good for minimal motion? That's a fair question. Would you see a benefit? I think you'd still see a quality benefit in the image. Uh, I think so. That's a good question, though. That is a fair question. Uh, worth testing. I'm probably not going to test that, but that's worth, worth looking at. Joshua says, I would like a long gop 400 megabit. Wouldn't that improve quality for videos without much motion? That's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, I don't know. Potentially, but I don't know. I like it. I like the question, though. Keep asking questions. Ask people who are smarter than me, though. Evan Weaver says, um, if I'm not worried about the five-second render mode after shooting with the Delkin SD cards of 400 megabit, are there any other cons? <clears throat> uh, I, I can't say hand on heart that there aren't. When you have a card that you know has a problem, in this case, the controller most likely being the culprit, what else might be going on in there is the question that you have to ask yourself. It's, it's a little bit of a baiting question. I don't, I can't say for sure. Um, I, I don't want to recommend it and say, no, if you don't mind that long wait time, then don't worry about it because maybe there's other underlying problems that are going to bite you in the butt somewhere down the line. Maybe like we saw with the early Lexar cards, you could actually end up with corrupted files, which would obviously not be good. Um, but that said, we, did, we are still saying that the V60, V90 cards, as long as they're rated with that from Delkin, are okay. They're still there, our second choice. So I think it's going to be fine, I think. But if you're going to spend the money... I'd honestly, I'd go for the, for the, if you're doing critical work, which, you know, let's face it, when you're shooting video, pretty important, you can't usually reproduce it twice, I would, um, I would go for those, those angel bird ones, those are my first choice, but I think most people are going to be just fine with the Delkins. I have not heard of problems, let's, let's put it that way, I have not heard a, oh my god, Delkin card, it failed, so that's a good sign, right, that is a good sign, so if you're going to be a betting man on it, if you're going to hedge your bets on it, I think you're going to be okay, I think you'll be okay. okay. <clears throat> Kevin Wright, SSDs aren't cheap, but the cost per gigabyte is still about half of the V90 SD cards, and they're actually faster. Uh, okay, cool. I hadn't actually compared the price, but that makes sense. It, but of course, bigger need for an external recorder. We already talked about why that may not work for you. Jim Williams, any experience with micro SD cards of equivalence? As I noticed, they tend to be cheaper for the same specs. No, I don't have any experience with that. Um, it would have to obviously go through an adapter to put into your camera. No, I don't know if you could, if that's a good idea or not to put a micro SD card into an SD card adapter into your camera. I don't know. But, pff, no idea. Give it a try, see what happens. Um, obviously, the micro SDs are mainly designed for things like drones that have those tiny little card slots in them. But yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know, unfortunately. Um, ooh, okay, Trevor, here we go. Trevor says, I've had failures with V60 and V90 Delkins. Well, there you go. Mmm. Mmm. Thank you, Trevor, for sharing that. Sorry to say that. Sorry to hear that. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, 
that is not a defined, therefore, Delkins are out. Uh, I think you can find people anywhere in the world, you can find an instance, multiple instances, where people have had problems with every single card manufacturer card out there. Right? The absolute best. I'm sure you can find people who've had problems with the Angel Wing cards as well, Angel Bird cards as well. Because there's, you know, th these are individual, highly technical electronic products. Clearly, they can get damaged. They can have an error, a flaw in manufacturing. Doesn't mean all of them are bad. It means that one is bad. Now, if you've had consistent problems with a bunch of different Delkin cards, that might be different. Uh, and let me know what uh, what your what your what your experience there is, Trevor. Although he is saying both V60 and V90s, that's two separate cards he has problems with. I don't know. It's not the greatest news in the world. Um, yeah, so something to think about. Brent says I have shot with micro SD card and a GH4 because of a snafu. Okay, well that's good. So it's it has worked for somebody. So that's cool. Good. All right. All right, folks. Well, that's that. I hope that was helpful and inform, 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 informative. informative. That's the word I was looking for. I hope that was educational and informative. There we go. Um, again, if you're going to buy any of these cards, do me a favor. Scroll down. Buy cards from the links down below. That helps a lot. Those, um, those little affiliate nickels do tend to add up when all of you go out and buy cards from there. So that helps to keep us on the air, as it were. We appreciate that. Of course, share this video. This is a, I think this is an, a good topic. Uh, a lot of people are going to want to know about this one. Share it far and wide. Tell your friends. Tweet it. Facebook it. All that stuff. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you have not already. And of course, please do give this, this video a thumbs up. If you believe that all my data is factually incorrect, then thumbs down it and tell me what's wrong in the comments. But uh, I did my homework on this one, and I think we got all the right info here. So that's that. Thanks a bunch for your time, everybody. I really appreciate all of you attending today live. There was a ooh, nice good number of live people today. Awesome. Love that. Thanks, folks. See you next time. Bye-bye.